We're now recording. So Stacy Krim and Kathleen McCarty Smith are talking about teaching and learning with primary sources, special collections, and university archives. Um, so take it away, Stacy and Kathleen. All right. Thanks, I'm, I'm Stacy Krim. I'm the curator of the manuscripts collection and our cello music collection. And I'm Kathleen McCarty Smith, and I am um, education and outreach archivist, and also um, currently interim head of the department. And today we're going to talk to you about what we love the most, special collections and archives. So what's going to happen is you're going to hear Kathleen and me talk over each other a lot. Um, since we're a small group, feel free to, um, you know, unmute yourself if you have a question or want to chat, or you can put a chat in the chat box as we go along. We're going to go ahead and get started. So... Just to give you a little bit of an overview of um, what we collect, our collecting areas, um, as well as this awesome photo of Randall Jarrell holding a cat, we focus on our university history, and that includes the official records of our university history um, in university archives. And we also have um, things you would not think are in an archive, such as textiles, artifacts, and photographs. We focus on a local and a regional history, and um, Greensboro has a very interesting history. So as you can imagine, that is a really fabulous um, research area. We have a focus on the visual and performing arts. We have the largest archive devoted to cello music in the world. Um, and uh, we also have a fabulous uh, collection devoted to art books printmaking, and history of the book in our rare books collection, as well as a great uh, history of American theater collection as well. We have other areas of, as well, but those are um, some areas of particular focus. Because of our institutional history as a women's college, we have a lot of, that covers a women's history. And uh, one of those special areas is the Women Veterans Historical Project. It is the largest academic archive devoted to American women veterans. So um, it is a wonderful archive. It um, has a lot of oral histories. It has textiles as well, lots of photographs um, and ephemera. Uh, by virtue of our wonderful Eng English department and MFA program, we have an amazing creative writing collection um, that's housed in our manuscripts collection. And we also have preservation services and preservation services is the department that uh, basically resurrects our material and works with repairing um, the damage, whether that is on a 500 year old book or <clears throat> a um, flyer that we have gotten from a protest yesterday. So they do amazing work there. So um, we view ourselves as a teaching archive, which means we want people to come in, we want them to feel comfortable. My first experience in an archive uh, was going on a tour with the class, and I think I was an undergraduate. And I walk into the archive, and the archivist there says something along the lines of, you know, okay, you know, remove, all, put all your bags in the lockers, remove everything of your pockets. And he says something along the lines of, it's not that we don't trust you, but we don't trust you. And that really stuck with me. Obviously, it has stuck with me for a very long time. Um, and then, of course, they close the doors and you cannot escape unless they let you out. And to let you out, they make they have to uh, press this thing that sounds like an alarm that goes off in a prison. So uh, that is not the environment we want for our students. So what we have done is opened our doors. Um, we do have a bell that goes off when you walk in. That does scare some students, but that's because we can't always uh, be uh, directly where we can see uh, when people come in. But we let people walk in. We let people look around. Um, we let people touch the material. There is very little in our archive that cannot be touched. In fact, we encourage it because um, that's an experience that students aren't going to get anywhere else. We uh, work heavily with faculty to do classes and tours so students can experience the archival environment. 
um, understand how it's a bit different from other library environments and have um, that first experience be a good experience so that they are not scarred for the rest of their lives. And I've actually worked with um, a faculty member that after their first class with me um, and the students were, were wrapping up and, and packing, she was like, yes, definitely come back. You're not going to find nicer a nicer archive than this. <laughs> These are really nice archivists. So um, I, I hope we do, and I think we do, make a very good first experience for students. So we have worked with um, a wide variety of classes. Um, we, will, we will try to fit within anyone's scope that we can. We are limited within our collecting area, but one thing we have been doing is we do try to collect or purchase towards, <clears throat> specifically towards instruction. So if we cannot find something that will meet your needs as instructors, we will, um, in our collection right now, we will go out and see if we can find that. That doesn't mean we're going to be able to buy a Gutenberg Bible, um, but maybe we can find, um, you know, a partial replica or something like that. So we do the best we can. Um, as you can see, we do a look, work a lot with the arts, we look, work a lot with the humanities, but we also, you'll also see um, business and kinesiology. Our institution has a very long history with women in athletics, so we have some pretty interesting stuff in our collection. Interior architecture also, um, we've given some pretty um, fascinating tours uh, given, with the architecture on our campus. And we're gonna go over some of these classes more in depth, but we have a lot of, um, a lot of uh, examples we can give you and we're very open to um, any type of session you can imagine. And here's examples of some of those. We are up to experimenting. So if you do not see something on this list that really strikes you, um, we would love to hear your ideas. So these are not the, the limitations, these are only ideas and suggestions. Sometimes we have classes come in for one-time sessions. Sometimes we work with classes throughout the entire semester. Sometimes we have classes uh, we, in the classroom, but most of the time we do have classes in our building because it's a bit of a field trip and students appreciate appreciate that change in atmosphere. Um, and it's easier for students to get their hands on the material here. So we love that element of collaboration. Um, we have really enjoyed working with classes. We also work with practicum students and capstone students a great deal. Um, so we're, we're gearing towards student success in as many ways as we possibly can. So there's a, many benefits um, that we can bring towards inclusion in your classes, um, including um, very much uh, hands-on learning. We can offer research support for your students. Um, we, as I said, we view ourselves as a teaching archive. So while we are not going to do the research for the student, we will sit down with them and hold their hand through the research process. Um, because we know it's hard uh, because we've had to do it before. Um, and we will tell them, uh, show them how to walk through examining and understanding primary sources and help them navigate collections, especially when a collection is big. Um, this is, the photo on this slide actually is me working with a practicum student. Um, their pra the, one of the projects in their practicum was uh, creating an exhibit in the Greensboro History Museum, which is exhibits even with small spaces are much more complicated than you would think. So we walk through students in all of the processes that we, we can to help them. Um, so it's a bit like re primary source research on training wheels. And then as they develop, uh, we pull away the training wheels and let them go off on their own. So the goal is always to have that interaction to promote them to build those skills to do what they need to do in their classes throughout the college curriculum and into the future. 
So we're teaching multiple kinds of literacies, um, although we're, we're usually focusing on primary source literacy. And if you have worked with other librarians, you probably have heard of these types of literacy. So information literacy is generally discerning the quality of the information. Um, is, this, is this information from a reasonable uh, source, a credible source? Primary source literacy is what we are highly concerned about um, because this is information that you has not been um, digested by someone. You have to figure out what it means um, to form your own opinion, and that is something students usually don't have much experience uh, in working with. So we know we have to be very careful in walking them through that process. We do work with visual literacy as well. We're going to show you some examples. Um, that's actually a very uh, primary source and visual literacy actually work very well together, as we're going to show you in a minute. Um, media literacy, uh, we do kind of tie into that with um, uh, definitely newspapers uh, and uh, modern media, because modern media is also can, can be considered archival material. Cultural literacy is important. As I said, Greensboro is one of our historic history focus focuses and uh, if depending on whose account you're looking at, if you're researching the sit-ins, you're going to see a certain perspective and it's important that students be able to recognize um, a, a perspective when they're that perspective when they are reading it. Um, financial literacy is not something we focus on as much, although we do have financial records in our collection. And of course, scientific literacy, we do have some scientific records, but that is not, uh, strictly speaking, our collection focus. So, as I mentioned, we focus primarily on primary source literacy, and these are the, um, the guidelines uh, for that. So we are we have guidelines that we follow to develop these specific skills that, that students need to be able to find, evaluate, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and synthesize and present the evidence. So we walk through this process in a few minutes. We're going to show you actually the assessment sheets where we um, actually give them prompts to help them walk through that process. We have walked with, we have worked with some K through 12 classes um, to actually bring this to the classroom. But what we are finding is that um, most students in their first year um, do not have this skill set. And unless they um, are coming to our sessions, uh, early on, I don't know how frequently this type of literacy is being trained in the classroom. So uh, this is one of the reasons we have really been emphasizing trying to work with instructors to um, collaborate and make certain students have these skills. So here's the overall framework of primary source literacy learning objectives. Um, if we are doing an exercise, so usually our classes are set up with a lecture component and an exercise component. This is going to be what the exercise components phases are going to be. They are going to be um, looking at the material. Um, we're going to show them in the lecture portion how to find in the material. We're going to show them how to analyze the material. Um, through that analysis, we're going to tell them how to interpret and understand that material. Then we're going to talk about how they would use that material. So we're trying to get the students to put these little pieces that primary sources are together, um, all these building blocks that um, are um, pieces of history to be create the historical narrative, so to speak. Um, I think students don't realize that history is not something that just comes fully formed. It's historians or scholars putting the little pieces together into the narrative. So it takes a little bit of time um, to, for students to learn that is a process that has to happen. 
Um, and he, Kat, now Kathleen is going to show us um, in a minute how um, we are going to be uh, talking, how we have used these in classes, but here you see some of the class setups that we have used. We have used traditional manuscripts documents, as you can see here. This is the um, death mask of Charles Duncan McKeever, the founder of our university. Very um, popular with the students. <laughs> and the chancellor. I mean, yeah, and the I, chancellor as well. <laughs> um, here is uh, Jugtown Pottery um, that we have in our collection. It's a North Carolina make of pottery. And here is a display from our rare books collection, but I do not remember precisely what this display is. So all of this material students are able to touch, even the rare book material, um, and examine. I want to pop in on this slide for just a minute. I think Stacy made a really good point earlier about how sometimes going into an archive can be a little bit intimidating for students. And we find that these kind of displays that um, just kind of capture and it, the imagination and engage the students right off really helps. If we were just, I mean, because often, as you see in the back, this is our Hodges reading room in the middle. And as you can see in the back, there's chairs. We do, we can do PowerPoints there. But as they walk in, instead of just having them sit at the, you know, in the chairs and we're ready for a presentation, we have displays um, relating to the class that they can come in and they can look at and kind of interact and make that transition from kind of not understanding really what an archives is to kind of getting into the class. And so that's one of the things that I think is one of our favorite things to do is kind of do these really engaging displays to help students either with the, with um, just kind of coming into the archives and then eventually, as you see on the right, with actually doing some document analysis. As I mentioned earlier, there's a very close tie between visual literacy and primary sources. So for um, lower level student classes, this is one of our favorite exercises that we do. We love using posters because it's really easy for students to uh, work within a group. Uh, and they usually have a very fun conversation <laughs> about them. And so these are some of our favorite posters to use, of course, because we have this American Women Veterans Historical Collection, we do have this focus that involves military posters. Uh, so we have uh, posters that are really propaganda posters. So they're meant to be uh, emotional. They're supposed, to, um, they're supposed to make you feel something. And students are going to react to that a little bit more than if I put a, a page of words in front of them and they can go through this much faster. So if we're doing an analysis of this, we're going to ask them things of, first of all, what, what do you see on this? Describe what do you see? Um, because students, a lot of times, just don't even take the time to describe what they see. Um, how does this make you feel? How do you think, what do you think the creator was trying to make someone feel with this? Why do you think this was made? Who was the audience? Um, what period do you think this was made? Um, so we begin asking questions like this, and the wonderful thing about this is there's no, um, the way we're asking questions is there's no real uh, right or wrong answer, uh, because especially the first year students get really worried about being, looking, getting the wrong answer in front of, in front of their friends, um, or some students actually just don't care and they'll give any answer under the sun, but um, so this is a uh, this is one of the easier information or primary source literacies exercises we do. And what we'll do is we'll set up, um, we'll have multiple tables. We'll set up posters on a set of posters on each table and we'll have either students at a set of students at each table or we'll have the students rotate through the different tables depending, excuse me, on the size of the class. Kathleen, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to, to pop in. So I just kind of reiterate what you're saying, depending on what um, which class comes in. Um, for example, if it's a freshman class or sophomore class or some, something, some group that is really not doing a lot of archival research, this is, you know, bringing out posters is a perfect, a perfect thing to do. Um, and it really does get in the whole the whole evaluation part. So if you find a source, you know, how what are you what are you going to do with it? You know, you catch the fish, you get it in the boat. Now what? And so taking them through evaluations like this really helps critical thinking. 
um, you know, the old the old journalism questions, the who, what, why, how, where, how does it contextualized, how do we find more information about something like this? And it really is quite a lot. These, these two examples are great because they both have the theme of that kind of World War II loose lips think ships. So the more you, you talk about what's going on, um, the more, uh, you know, one of these soldiers could actually uh, be hurt. And this is, of course, during World War II. A lot of them are familiar with that or have studied that. So they can kind of jump in and give it context themselves. And we can kind of explain the difference between these two in the sense that you see to the left, this man is going off to war, you know, it's a pretty soft sell. If you tell where he's going, he may never get there. And then on the right, the same type of theme, but much, you know, much more dramatic and effective, someone talked. And, you know, we have the, the students kind of all catch on that um, the audience is everyone and he's pointing at you. So this is a this is this is a great example. I uh, I was trying to get the someone talked made into a postcard for our department. Yes. But that didn't go over. <laughs> <laughs> so here's uh, an example of an assessment sheet. Uh, this is an assessment poster from the National Archives, actually. So it, it contains some of the um, basics of what you would expect to see in any assessment sheet um, that an archives would use. And it's a very basic one. So this is something we would most likely use in an introductory level class. Um, and this is specifically for posters. Um, of course, um, the National Archives Library of Congress, all of these large libraries have huge poster collections. So, and a lot of them are digitized. So um, there's some tremendous online resources there. As you can see, they, um, are asking some of the exact questions that we have brought up. They're focusing on very concise information, which is just trying to get the students to articulate the, the questions, articulate the information. Um, so uh, this is a very good resource you can find online. And, and and we and as far as assessment, I mean, sometimes we may have the students doing an actual you know sheet like this, a form, or sometimes we'll just ask it, kind of just do a verbal assessment, just depending on kind of how the class is going and what level students are. Yeah, so again, we I, don't want to intimidate a lower level you know group necessarily with sitting down and filling out a form like this. So we're very we're very flexible about that. I think we have the forms we use later. We do. Yeah, I do. Okay, good. Um, we have like three different types of forms ranging in complexity. Um, so we have forms that are more complex than this for upper level students. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Kathleen for the upper level for the um, class examples. Okay, great. Um, all right, I'm just going to give an example. We do, we, as we've mentioned, we do a, a wide range of classes, and that's one of the reasons why our job is so fascinating, because we teach so, so much variety, and we have great material that we can bring out um, for these particular classes. So, we, for example, we teach some classes um, from, you know, the photography group, which is actually under the art department. And it gives us a wonderful opportunity to bring it, bring out our vast camera collection, historical photographs, daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, just everything you can think of. We don't put anything out that the students can't touch. Matter of fact, half the battle is getting them to touch it because they come in and they're just kind of scared to get, you know, actually touch the material. But we always encourage them to do that because it really is like touching history and it really does affect them. So this is just an example of one of the photography classes that we have out. Let's see. Okay, this is the same class. So you see on the left, that's our Hodges reading room. We have the camera display, we do a short PowerPoint, and then we bring the students next door to our researcher room, what you see right there with, um, with historical photographs they can actually get their hands on. This particular class has um, has the assessment sheets and pencils, but it's a great way for them to talk as a group about what they're seeing. Um, in this case, each class, each, I'm sorry, each table had their own uh, kind of different theme of photographs, and then we all share out. So it's really, it's really kind of a great system, this kind of two-room system we have as far as PowerPoint um, display and then hands-on analysis. And then we can kind of switch up from there. Um, even in larger classes, what we do is we bring more archivists in, we split the class, one group does the Hodges reading room, one, you know, one group does the analysis, and then we switch off. So we can handle almost any size of class like this. 
print making, we actually have a Washington Press in our um, in our hot little hands. You see that up to the left. Um, it is working. It is completely. Um, it is a completely working press, and we also have classes in that do variations of printmaking exercises. So we, as you can see below, they set the type. They can look at displays of printed material, and then they can actually design and print um, what what they what they set up. So this is this has been great as well. Okay, historical message for social studies, that is a required course, and we've had some really great projects with that. Um, we also, I wanted to mention here, we can also set up lib, lib guides for the different classes. You see this one is for his, History 430, and the great part of this is these lib guides give the students through these tabs access to digital um, sources online, um, you know, primary sources that necessarily they cannot get online, uh, just anything, you know, the, the difference between photographs, artifacts, secondary sources. This is really a great method for us to um, kind of give the student a really practical takeaway. Um, and for the professors as well. So they don't have to remember who to contact or where to find some of these online sources. They have it right in this libguide. With historical methods, we've used, a couple of times we've used our vast scrapbook collection. So we have an enormous amount of scrapbooks and you wouldn't necessarily think so, but scrapbooks give an incredible amount of um, research opportunities for students and faculties and researchers actually. We have, oh my goodness, probably all in all, Stacey, what do we have? Probably over 400 scrapbooks um, between all of our collections, if, if not more. And a lot of times we'll have the students come in. It's kind of like speed dating. They'll come in, they'll look, they'll meet their scrapbook and um, get to go through it, get their hands on it. And then they're also all digitized. So the student can, from then on, um, they like to kind of think of it as then, then they just go online with their scrapbook. So this has been very, very popular. And it's a great way to show the students that there is a real place in scholarship for both using analog and digital material. This is some examples of some of the scrapbooks pages that we're using. Uh, from the different ages, we have them, you know, from the late 1800s till probably the 2000s. And um, and so this is this you can see how engaging this is and the students just love it. Um, we do a, we do a, again, an amazing amount of art classes, which is really interesting. Um, this is alternate phot photographic processes. This is this. These are two examples of student products. The one on the left, there's that death mask again, every student's favorite, but it's superimposed over letter, a letter that was written from Charles Document from Charles Duncan McKeever to his wife Lula. And on the right, that is that's your that's your guy Wade Brown there, Stacy, who is the head of uh, was the head of the music department. And the student has kind of deconstructed Wade Brown by uh slicing up any not the real photograph, of course, but a digital image. Um, this is Digital Darkroom. It's a great class as well. We bring, we've brought in these classes almost every semester for years, and we'll have everything from a display to a PowerPoint to evaluation, um, and in some cases, even student exhibits. So we're usually brought in with uh, a student project on this class, which is really great as well. Oh, okay. No, we're, okay, that's right. I'm sorry about that. We are going long. Um, so anyway, just more digital darkroom displays. Uh, we use a lot of these class projects are luckily and we it, it enables the students to not only do the project, but also be displayed and they get a big kick out of this because um, they really do enjoy having that opportunity to do a project and then have it displayed somewhere in the library where they can see it and their friends can see it. And here's some more examples of different exhibits that our students have done with their class projects or as interns. Um, just some more I'm going to breeze through because I know we're running late. Um, this one was a, a writing class. It's an English class. And the students were doing um, work with, I believe, zines and things that they were creating on their own after seeing a display from our collections. Uh, this is a social justice theme. Our students um, here actually uh, participated in the 1960s Woolworth sit-ins, and a, a fact we're very much proud of, and we've got some great information about that, and the students can come in, hear the story, um, and then go in, we, into our researcher room, and we do a really interesting and engaging 
um, hands-on analysis of primary sources relating to this. There's students that participated. They were found out because they were wearing their class jackets. Um, here's a bunch of just examples of historical uh, perspectives through documentation that we talk about. Um, books and manuscripts, we have got an incredible rare book collection um, dating back to the 1400s, incredible manuscripts, and you can see how we bring those in um, for classes as well. Here's just some more examples of students really engaging with the material. Stagecraft theater is, is, is a natural for us. We have a lot of different textiles from the history of the university and beyond, and we can bring those out. And the students really love engaging with this. This is another um, way we can really kind of bring them into the, you know, the, the physical form of history. And I love the pictures to the right because they really were having a great time with this class. Um, another printmaking class uh, where they're setting type. Um, we've, you see to the left, this is actually a classroom where we were able to go to the classroom and do part of this uh, workshop as well. Just some more classroom. This, is, this brings out a whole bunch of really interesting information that we have um, for religion class, including um, some, some that is, is uh, ancient, you know, ancient spiritualism as well, which the students kind of get a kick out of. Here's some examples of our assessment sheets. We have them, these were kind of made in-house. These are at every kind of every class level. And so um, we kind of have expect, different expectations of what each class level is learning. So we are going to approach this with a freshman class much different than what we would, how we would approach this with, for example, you know, a junior or senior class. And we can kind of pick one of these assessment sheets if it, if it relates and when it relates. And then we kind of put that into a rubric that we have, um, because this is something that we have certain goals too. So we are very much supportive of the professor's goals, student goals, class goals, but we also have our own. So we have certain things we want the students to leave with, and these assessments help us with that as well. Um, we, we have all kinds of instructional examples like this in our quarterly review newsletter, and you can definitely pop on that and just look under school of quarterly review. We are um, we also do all kinds of different events with students as well. So anything that promotes student success. So I don't online resources, Sam, I think we thought we were going to have a little bit longer than we are. We, we are. So if anyone wants to stay and look. Um, tour through our online resources. Can we do that, Sam? Yep. Okay. Okay. Great. Yay. All right. So our online resources, um, the platform is called Gateway, um, and you will find the information is divided in the collecting areas that we had described earlier. And um, this is one of those places that you're just going to get absolutely uh, lost in if you uh, have time on say a Thursday that is really a Friday and it's the end of the day. So there's the link in chat. So as you'll see, here are the collecting areas. We also do a lot of projects with community members. So you're going to see some of those collaborative projects online. Um, and uh, so here is UNCG history. UNCG History is a collection of our university archives and manuscripts collections primarily. So, so some of those uh, scrapbooks that Kathleen mentioned are also available on um, this, as well as yearbooks, which are called the Pine Needles. So over here on the right side, you can see some of the navigation information. So the yearbooks. Um, I think the yearbooks went up to 1993. Is that right, Kathleen? Right, and all our campus publications are digitized and online. Right. So the Carolinian is the newspaper, um, course catalogs. Um, we also have something called uh, class uh, subject files, graduating class subject files. So that's like a folder of material that's like a time capsule about information of that graduating class, which is great. 
And then of course, um, the campus building grounds and views, which is um, photos and maps of the campus over time, which is really amazing to see. You can um, also narrow down according to the type of item as well as the topic. So if I am interested in UNCG history, specifically African-American history, I can go, uh, I can narrow it down that way. I can see there's 460 items here. And if I wanted to narrow it down even more specifically um, to desegregation as a topic, what I can do is actually, um, let's say if I did not know when the school was desegregation, it is available as a tag for me here, or I could go to the 1950s here. So if I go here, I can learn about uh, the process our students, our school went through um, to become desegregated. And most of these items were digitized as part of our civil rights Greensboro collection, which I will show you as well. So that's a tremendous source. We use um, our digital collections heavily. Um, I know a lot of professors are very interested in finding ways to work around students using AIs to generate uh, papers. And one way to do that is by having them use archival primary sources to create those papers, um, to have them do primary source research. Because if the research hasn't been done yet, the AI can't write the paper for them. So I've actually been working with a music research class this semester that the entire class decided to do a research topic um, to focus on it, and the end project was going to end up being a um, a website, I think, is what they're working on, and maybe a timeline. And what they are doing is they are looking at um, how Johann Sebastian Bach has been performed and taught throughout the history of our campus, which was I mean, like, I was so excited to work with this class because that is something I have never remotely thought about. Um, so what we were pulling from heavily was our school bulletins as well as these. These are our, our um, School of Music program and program uh, recital and recording uh, programs. So um, this is research that was research that hadn't been done. There's no way AI could have written it. So um, it was entirely uh, new information. So those sorts, of pro pro those sorts of projects, not only are they interesting for students, they teach students how to do the research, the students have fun, and it's very hard for the students to, te to, te to, te to cheat. So um, a few highlights and exhibits I would like you to be aware of. Um, during 2020, when um, the George Floyd murder protests were happening in Greensboro, we did start a collection to document what was happening. So that is called the um, Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations and protest art collection. Um, and primarily it is focusing on um, Greensboro, but it does have some content from other places. And most of this is um, material, most of this is fo photographs that either someone on the team who is working on this or um, someone else, oh, the screen has not changed off the first tour slide, sorry. Okay, let me try sharing again. There we go. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay. So this is the gateway that I was trying to show you. So this is the Black Lives Matter protest collection. This is primarily photographs. Um, and it is, a lot of it was generated by us. So this is actually a picture of the rock on campus. Um, there weren't many people on campus at this time. So I literally took this photo as we were walking in. Uh, but we also um, took photos of downtown Greensboro. So you're going to see downtown Greensboro, what it looked like. This has been used in, in classes. Um, so you're going, we also have demonstrations caught um, and photographed. So 
this was a really wonderful project to, to work with. We have also um, here Civil Rights Greensboro, which I mentioned. This is basically a collection of segments of collections from multiple universities and museums and archives that focus on the history of civil rights in Greensboro. Um, so it is a tr tremendous source for education. And it does include subject essays, um, and lesson plans because it was created um, to some degree with K through 12 in mind. So it's very easy to access. Um, there's a lot of information about our school here. There's also information about the, um, the um, desegregation of Greensboro, the Greensboro sit-ins, some about the Greensboro massacre. There's about to be a lot more about the Greensboro massacre because we're digitizing a collection about that. So you will find a lot more. And we also have Pride of the Community, which is our LGBTQ local history collection. Um, this is still a growing collection. So these are usually mostly individual collections, personal collections of material that we have been allowed to digitize and put in online, but they for the most part belong to other people. Um, we do include oral histories with this. And um, there is a very strong UNCG presence, of course, because we um, are most easily able to get information from UNCG. This is one of my favorite scrapbooks in the collection because um, in no way do I mean to say this in a negative way, but um, this is just the most colorful and gay looking scrapbook um, ever. I absolutely love it. This uh, man, he chronicled the the entire time of his coming out process until he got married, essentially. Um, so you get to see that entire process through scrapbooking and it's just absolutely amazing um, and wonderful. So if you wanna find us, how you find us um, and our digital collections that I just showed you is go to the library homepage, which is library.uncg.edu. You can go to those digitized collections from here, digitized collections that will take you to Gateway. You can also go to special collections and archives, which is where we live. You, you can, can also into... Google that straight. If you just if you forget this, you can just UNCG special collections and it'll come right up. Yep. Um, you can also go to digital collections here. You can um, contact us off this page and we also have our newsletter available here. And we are also available on chat if you need to get in touch with us. So thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. We'll put our um, our emails in chat in case you'd like to, to contact us for more information. Great. So Daniel and Kathleen, do y'all have any questions? Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, we hope to see you in the archives. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, so like I said, this is the last one of the semester. Here is what we did all semester. And here's also where you will find the next semester. Fall 2023 is when we'll be back. We don't do this in the summer. Uh, so if you want to see recordings, uh, that is where they are. But also that's where we will email you directly the recording, everyone who signed up. Um, when it is processed on YouTube. So thanks y'all. Have a good week, everyone, right? Or long weekend, Thursday. I forgot about the long weekend for a second. Um, okay, well, thanks, Stacey and Kathleen. Have a good <laughs> long weekend, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.